welcome to another episode of In Focus brought to you by the Uongozi Institute. I'm your host, Guamaka Kifukwe. The extraction of non-renewable natural resources, such as natural gas, is ultimately unsustainable. And a country has to plan for a future when those stocks are either in decline or outright depleted. And it must do this in the context of balancing the needs of the current generation against those of future generations. One of the vehicles for safeguarding the interests of future generations is sovereign wealth funds. And with me in studio today to discuss sovereign wealth funds and how they work is Mr. Knut Sjær, former head of the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. Mr. Sjær served as the head until 2008, and since then has been working as advisor to several countries' sovereign wealth funds, including China, Singapore, Netherlands, and Ireland. Mr. Sjær, welcome to the program. Thank you. I just want to get started for the benefit of some in the audience who might not know. What exactly do we mean by sovereign wealth funds, and why are they attractive? There are uh, different types of uh, sovereign wealth funds around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the normal sovereign wealth fund is about uh, saving resource uh, revenues mm -hmm. for future generations. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of protecting uh, future generations mm -hmm. so that uh, the current generation is not uh, spending all, all the oil revenue or all the gas uh, revenue. But then how do sovereign wealth funds work? I mean, it's a word that's thrown around. How do they function? Oh, there are so many different ways they are functioning. Mm -hmm. But normally, uh, it is uh, about creating an institution, mm -hmm. or as in Norway, a part of the central bank, mm -hmm. that has the responsibility of uh, investing uh, the money in different the markets. Mm -hmm. But uh, the key thing is that uh, the whole government, the parliament, and the population mm -hmm. buys into it. Mm -hmm. That everybody understands the perspective of future uh, generations. Mm -hmm. But it, as I understand it, with the sovereign wealth fund, what you've taken is some of the money that comes as revenue from, say, the natural gas sector and so forth, and decided to, to put it aside. Um, how do you decide, what, like, what factors do you consider about setting that divide now between what should be saved and what should be reinvested? Yeah, you know, that is also um, not one single practice mm -hmm. or one best practice between uh, different type of funds, different countries. I think uh, Tanzania case uh, will be different from uh, the Norway case. Uh, you need to have a long-term view. Uh, you may have years uh, where you cannot save anything into the fund because you need it for the budget and for investing in the gas uh, explorations and the infrastructure. Uh, in Norway, for example, it took many years from uh, the first oil revenue came into the coffins of the government until we get money into the fund. So we can need time to create the infrastructure that you need for securing uh, future oil and gas revenue, but also for building a structure that is important for the society. You have mentioned the Norwegian example, and also Tanzania is looking to have their own sovereign wealth fund. But at what point do we decide that it's now time to start putting money into this fund? Uh, first, uh, you have to create a vision mm -hmm. of uh, taking care of future generations. And you should start doing that as soon as uh, possible, even though know it will take uh, years. But this is about uh, awareness among uh, all of you, that you have to protect uh, resource uh, revenue so that you get most out of it. Uh, it's so much at stake. And, you know, the normal thing for countries having uh, resource wealth is to get poorer. Uh, it is to spend all the revenue, so we bid up the prices, the wages, and we get a country that can only do one thing, and that is to live uh, by the oil uh, revenues. Uh, one sad example now is uh, Venezuela. With the current fall in the oil price, they are close to going bankrupt. Uh, they have built the whole social structure 
on uh, resource revenue. Even everybody knows that uh, this belongs also to future generations. So you have to attack uh, the paradox of uh, finding uh, resources, uh, pumping up oil and gas, and at the same time avoid getting uh, lazy, uh, getting complacent, and uh, get uh, the whole economy dependent on just one single uh, source of income. So I think for you already early on to say that we have an ambition to protect the future generations because that will also help you avoid misuse all the future revenue. But in the context of a poor country like Tanzania for example we do have you know, debt that needs servicing. We have huge infrastructure gaps. Wouldn't we be, I don't want to say better off, but wouldn't it be also a kind of investment in the future to get rid of that debt first, start to build the roads before we start putting away savings? Yeah, and uh, that puts you in a different situation like uh, Norway. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Norwegian case, when I mean, you have an economy that already is going at full capacity utilization, mm -hmm. it doesn't give much meaning to invest even more, because then you get uh, bottlenecks and, uh, and problems. Mm -hmm. But in your case in Tanzania, I still think it's important to ensure that the resource uh, revenues uh, are clear, that you have transparency, Transparency, uh, that we have an understanding that this is also for future uh, generations. Mm -hmm. It starts with the quality of the way you run the oil and gas sector, mm -hmm. with full transparency into the projects, with no uh, tolerance for any uh, corruption, mm -hmm. and with a clear understanding that you need to get into your state to the people, mm -hmm. most of the revenues. Mm -hmm. uh, the failure of uh, emerging market countries is that they get too dependent on uh, international uh, companies, yeah. but also that they have too much corruption, mm -hmm. so that you don't have the transparency in the way you generate uh, revenue. So even before you come to the stage of getting money into the oil fund, mm -hmm. uh, you must avoid the potential negative outcome mm -hmm. of creating a sector that mm -hmm. is uh, non-transparent, mm -hmm. corrupt, inefficient, mm -hmm. and not create uh, the revenue in the first place. Sure. But, I mean, I'm glad you've mentioned this, but then what, what other kind of should we call it an institutional setup, do you need in order to have an effective sovereign wealth fund? Mm -hmm. You know, you've mentioned the vision and then having these kind of transparency and so forth, but what else is needed in place in order for you know, someone to manage a sovereign wealth fund in an effective way? Yeah. Um, it is about uh, the parliament mm -hmm. uh, to put up a legislation mm -hmm. to frame the concept uh, of a future uh, sovereign wealth fund. Uh, how it will get the revenues, mm -hmm. how much of the revenues that will be spent on uh, the budget, how you want to invest uh, mm -hmm. the remaining assets, uh, if you uh, are going to invest them, mm -hmm. and how do you keep them accountable? Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that those people investing in assets mm -hmm. have an international uh, market competence, mm -hmm. that they are not becoming victims of the Wall Street of the world and sure. are not able to the, do the job in, uh, mm. in, a, in, in a good way. So the parliament need to create that vision, need to set up the legislation, and need to get the buy-in from uh, all the different uh, segments of the, uh, politics. Mm. And everybody then need to get the buy-in from the, from the people. Sure. But it is just to push a little bit further on this, yeah. is it enough to have it run through Parliament? I mean, should you protect this position given its potential sensitivity as the manager of the Sovereign Wealth Fund? Should yeah. that be protected, say, by Constitution? Or is uh, that too much now? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in Norway, it functions the way as uh, I explained to you. Yeah. And the Parliament has uh, a discretion mm -hmm. to uh, 
every year decide how much to spend, mm -hmm. but they have also decided on a guidance, a rule for, uh, that limits how much they can uh, mm -hmm. spend. In other countries, this is done, as you say, by legislation. Mm -hmm. And that is protecting uh, uh, future generations, in a way, mm -hmm. from a parliament one year uh, being totally irresponsible. Sure. But this is about uh, more kind of philosophical thinking. Mm -hmm. Can one parliament, through legislation, mm -hmm. commit future parliaments? Sure. In the ideal world, you have an ongoing anchoring Mm. So we don't need to do that. Sure. But maybe you can find ways of uh, protecting uh, that is in between here. Mm. Uh, that give people a feeling that not just a new parliament and everything will change. Mm. Because if that is the situation, if people don't believe in the structure, they will not support that some of their saving go into such a fund. Mm. And from my understanding, there are two broad kind of functions that you see in, mm -hmm. in sovereign wealth funds. Uh, one is this kind of long-term investments, and then you have this sort of short-term stabilization as, as a kind of mechanism. Beginning with, with the long-term, mm -hmm. what do we, you know, how long is long-term? When we say mm -hmm. long-term investments, long-term savings, are we talking 20, 30, 50 years? We do. Okay. Uh, you know, when we talk about the resource uh, revenues, they have been in the ground for uh, millions of years. Uh, and uh, you have them now. Uh, one day you have uh, pumped up everything. But you need then to have uh, a fund that is giving you a permanent uh, income, replacing the ongoing income you are uh, not getting anymore. Mm -hmm. So investing in a long uh, horizon framework means invest very much in equities. That means you have to live through volatile markets. Mm -hmm. And I can explain to you how we do that in, uh, uh, in Norway. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's a paradox in investing uh, that uh, if you do uh, that everybody want to do uh, and just invest when everything is fine, mm. uh, you will not get any return that is compensating for the inflation. Uh, when you have a long-term perspective, uh, the first thing you have to do is to ensure that you get protection from uh, inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say you invest everything outside uh, Tanzania, like Norway, you invest everything outside uh, Norway. Mm -hmm. It's inflation in all the countries, and your return must be higher over uh, the time, mm -hmm. so that inflation, where you invest, is not eating up your assets. The only way to protect uh, a sovereign wealth fund from inflation of the long uh, haul is to put much of it in equities. Mm -hmm. But you know, as soon as you invest uh, a national fund in equities, mm -hmm. uh, you get a very volatile return. Mm -hmm. You get years with negative return, and people can start screaming. Mm. And I experienced that when I was running the fund in Norway. In, and how do you deal with that? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, with big headlines, uh, sure. <laughs> with the photo of uh, myself mm. uh, all over the first page. Mm. To deal with that uh, was so much about uh, when we started up to explain the strategy, mm -hmm. to anchor it. Mm -hmm. uh, to have the parliament having a big say in the strategy uh, by we advising the parliament, mm -hmm. uh, showing 100-year uh, return examples, sure. uh, showing that, yes, we can get very bad years in the future, mm -hmm. uh, but to protect you against inflation, you need to commit to it. Mm -hmm. And we created uh, a rule that is called rebalancing, mm -hmm. that is saying, if you have a year with equity market is falling very much, you buy more equities. Okay. So that you get up to the 40% or 60% uh, equity portion in, uh, in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. And that means you put in a decision-making system uh, that is safeguarding the parliament mm -hmm. and the manager yeah. <laughs> from doing bad mistakes. Uh, you understand when you start up that the biggest mistake in investments mm. 
is to invest with the cycle, mm. is to buy equities when everybody tells you that you should, mm. and sell when everybody gets nervous. Mm. That is uh, the recipe for losing money. Sure. Uh, you need to establish a mechanism so that your investment vehicle mm -hmm. is uh, trading, buying equities against the cycle, mm -hmm. uh, being contrarian uh, investor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when you look at uh, other successful investors uh, like uh, Warren Buffett, mm -hmm. uh, it's all about the doing the opposite of the market, mm -hmm. being contrarian, having dry powder when uh, the market crash. Mm. And when normal people are selling, and the headlines in the newspapers say that uh, you should uh, leave everybody's crazy being in equities, mm. then that type of investor is buying. Mm. That is being contrary an investor. And then you recover as it comes yeah. back up, as it were. So when you set up a sovereign wealth fund, you invest in uh, financial assets uh, internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, you need good people, of course, uh, but you also need a decision-making system mm. so that you safeguard that those people are not making this uh, mistake. Sure. This has worked fantastically well in Norway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so in 2008, 2009, when we had the financial crisis, uh, I had left the fund then, it was my successor running it. Mm -hmm. The fund was the biggest buyer of equities globally. So when so many investors uh, were selling equities, yeah, you were. prices falling, mm -hmm. Norway was buying at discount. Mm. So this is also a part of setting up a sovereign wealth fund. Sure. <laughs> it doesn't help you to save uh, if you don't have uh, a system mm -hmm. for ensuring that the saving is well uh, protected. Sure. I just want to, as a very small point, you mentioned your successor after you. Mm. How do you go about deciding on a successor? How do you get that kind of continuity? Or is this you know, an appointee? Or is it someone that is groomed through a kind of system? Is it kind of a competitive application? How do, how do you pick you know, who should steer the ship, as it were? Yeah, in Norway, this is organized as a separate uh, department of uh, the central bank. Okay. Uh, it's called Norges Bank Investment Management. Mm -hmm. And we did set it up in uh, 98. When I left in 2007-8, uh, uh, I uh, went to uh, the chairman of the board, the central bank governor, mm -hmm. uh, and I said, uh, I think it's on time for uh, you to find another person. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have done my job after 10 years, sure. and my people deserve a change. Mm -hmm. And I said also, by the way, I know who you should appoint. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my head of equities. And we had worked together for many years. Mm. We actually worked together in uh, another company before we started the Sovereign Health Fund. Mm -hmm. And he's the person running the fund now. Mm -hmm. uh, he was building the equity management uh, from scratch mm. and has excellent uh, knowledge and competence. Mm. So it was still a competitive mm. uh, competi uh, bid for that uh, job. Mm. It was uh, headhunters, mm -hmm. and he was uh, competing against uh, other people, mm -hmm. also with people with, uh, coming from other countries than, uh, than Norway. Okay. You need the best person. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so now to kind of shift their attention to the more short-term stabilization element mm. of it. What exactly are you safeguarding? What, what are we stabilizing when you perform that function as a sovereign wealth fund? No, uh, when you invest for the long horizon, mm -hmm. uh, get protection against inflation, mm -hmm. you have to accept short-term volatility. Mm -hmm. An investor cannot get it both. You mm -hmm. cannot have uh, a positive return every month no, of course. <laughs> and protect yourself against uh, inflation of the long haul. Mm -hmm. That is impossible. Mm -hmm. So you have to make a choice. You have to say that uh, short-term stabilization is not important. Mm -hmm. It is a long-term return that uh, matters. Mm -hmm. And you have to explain that uh, to the parliament. They have to buy into it. And uh, of course, uh, the people, the press, mm -hmm. everybody needs to understand that basic concept. So how do you protect now, coming back to this vision, I mean, you can have you know, a change in parliament, you can have a change in, in a head of state, for example, that comes and says, no, actually, mm. 
we need to take money out of we need to take money out of this fund mm. because you know, something has collapsed or we need to um, fix schools or, or whatever it is. How do you say no? How do you get that discipline to say no? This needs to stay here. Mm. You need to find somewhere else to get the money from. Yeah. And I will not say that it is easy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what I say is that most countries fail. Mm -hmm. Most countries don't manage to do this, and they end up with the paradox, having resources, mm -hmm. becoming poorer. Mm -hmm. So you have to make a decision in, at the national level mm -hmm. and get the buy-in from people that we want to be among those few countries mm -hmm. doing this uh, well. This means when you have a parliament and you have a government, uh, they don't make big changes mm -hmm. without getting on board uh, everybody, mm. a kind of consensus uh, thinking. Sure. In Norway, um, we have had uh, several governments since it started uh, with the oil fund, mm -hmm. and no new government did major change to what the former government did. No new parliament did changes. Mm. But every parliament and every government taking a next step like uh, taking in more equities, mm -hmm. they ensured anchoring of that uh, decision. Yeah. I think this holds also for your policy uh, with respect to the oil and gas sector, the energy sector. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't allow one government to do something that is deadly against 40% uh, of uh, the people. Mm -hmm. You should try to find broad consensus solution mm -hmm. so that you keep continuity mm -hmm. and that you unite uh, to protect the resources to get most of the tax income into the state and not to the foreign companies and, and so on. And not to look at it a bit from, from the other end with sovereign wealth funds, like we've, mm. we're focused a bit on how you protect sovereign wealth funds. But what about protecting economies from sovereign wealth funds? Because, I mean, we're talking a lot of money. Yeah. And there's nothing really to stop you from you know, buying strategic assets in another country and having a major say in the global economy. Mm. How do you kind of manage that element of, of a sovereign wealth fund? You know, that was a big debate in uh, 2007, mm -hmm. 2008. Then came the financial crisis, and then banks around the world needed uh, to be rescued. And some of them were rescued by uh, sovereign wealth fund. Mm -hmm. So you got from the situation with critique mm -hmm. to the situation where you needed that uh, capital. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not understand that critique uh, uh, when I was running the assets uh, in Norway. Okay. Because over capital went to companies uh, all over the world and creating uh, more opportunities for so many companies. Mm. And I think we represented a stable uh, ownership. If we were to use the capital for power, that will be on the cost of future generations in Norway. Mm. When you have a professional organization, you have accountability, you measure the performance all the time, mm. it cannot become a power vehicle. Mm. It's there for uh, professional investments, and that is good for the markets. Mm. Uh, I think in general, uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds, they provide more stability to the capital markets mm -hmm. because they are doing the opposite of uh, the herd mentality in the market. Mm -hmm. They can come in and buy more assets when prices are falling because they have the long-term uh, perspective. Sure. And, and you mentioned that in, in Norway's particular case, the sovereign wealth fund has focused its investment overseas. Mm. Um, is there a role for sovereign wealth funds to be investing internally? Or is that a bit risky because of the politics and in, in a way maybe distorting markets that are emerging? You know, uh, it's different uh, solutions to that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Norway is uh, special 
vid uh, not investing in Norway. Mm-hmm. And Norway is a very small market. Mm-hmm. Uh, a good argument for investing, uh, like in your case, outside Tanzania only, mm-hmm. is that you avoid the political problems with investments. Mm-hmm. Uh, you avoid the rent-seeking behavior. Mm. I mean, that you have in every country with uh, much resources. Sure. It's people fighting for uh, the revenues. Yeah. And you have to keep the sovereign wealth fund away from that uh, fighting. Mm. Then you could say that uh, we still need much investments in Tanzania. Yes. <laughs> but that can be done by the normal investment decisions by the parliament. Mm-hmm. that they take on the budget every year. Mm-hmm. So if you have a powerful sovereign wealth fund investing in Tanzania, mm-hmm. that is taking away some of the power from the parliament. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you create a kind of power base uh, that comes above politicians. Mm. So I would advise you to keep all the investments outside Tanzania mm-hmm taking into account that you still use much of the resources mm. internally for investment in the sector, in the energy sector, mm. and for other infrastructure investments. Sure. The remaining assets going into the sovereign wealth fund could then be invested totally outside uh, your country. Sure. And just to kind of now moving to the tail, is there anything we haven't really considered yet in, in our discussion in terms of risks associated with, with sovereign wealth funds and, and how they're governed and how they can be used from your experience? <laughs> I, I think your questions uh, have covered uh, all the major uh, issues. Okay. Uh, it is a risk that you don't aim for creating a fund. Mm-hmm. that you misuse uh, all the opportunities. Mm-hmm. It is a risk that you destroy your economy mm-hmm. by uh, resource uh, revenues, uh, that you let rent seekers uh, take over the control, mm-hmm. that you let corruption uh, take place, mm-hmm. and that you get a leadership in the country that is basing uh, their power mm-hmm. on uh, taking those resource uh, opportunities and revenues Mm -hmm. and uh, buy support from the population. Mm -hmm. That is a Venezuela case. So the risk of doing nothing uh, is uh, quite high. Mm -hmm. And uh, the risk of creating a fund, yes, uh, I think that is much much lower. Mm -hmm. Uh, the risk when you create a fund is, uh, as you have uh, said, that you get a new government changing uh, the system. But you sh- should ensure a robustness, uh, that everybody buys into the key uh, principles. Mm-hmm. And I think you can do that in this uh, country. The last part of the risk here is uh, the investment risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you not have in place uh, enough competence, that those people running the fund are victims of uh, the global financial market and don't have their own competence, mm. and that you have uh, uh, heard uh, behavior mentality mm. and are not able to create the contrarian uh, investor mindset. Sure. This you can solve by uh, decision-making rules and mm-hmm. uh, the rebalancing. Sure. And then just one, maybe a bit more of a, of a theoretical, but can a sovereign wealth fund then ever make too much money? Is that, is that ever a problem? Should you ever cap and say, okay, we've, we've got enough assets now and let's stop? I mean, is that even possible? No, uh, I don't see that happen in uh, any country at any time. Uh, it's so much uh, need for uh, capital to future generations, especially in societies where you have an uh, eldering uh, of the population, mm-hmm. more uh, people uh, uh, taking uh, pensions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need that uh, capital, and also Tanzania can come in to that situation many years from, uh, from now. And you will have, of course, years uh, when the capital market is going fine, 
where you have high return, but you have decision-making systems to reinvest that into the fund and not fuel the budget that year with too much money, because that could be very negative. And then just in, in closing, is, is there anything else you'd like our audience to maybe hear about sovereign wealth funds before we close the show? Mm, no thanks, I appreciate this uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe um, a last uh, sentence uh, that uh, I think it's incredibly important for Tanzania mm -hmm. to have the ambition to create uh, a sovereign uh, wealth fund. You have to think long term and you have to protect the uh, resources so that you get the most efficient uh, production and that uh, you have transparency on the revenues and that you have a clarity in the society uh, how important those resource revenue can be and that you have a vision about uh, some years from now uh, you manage to save some of it for future generations. Sure. Well, on that note, thank you very much for, for joining us on the program and, and, and welcome back whenever you want. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank pleasure you. to be here. Thank you. thank you. And for those of you at home, join us again on another program soon. Goodbye.